Tonight, new twists and turns in a tense labor dispute at Canada's largest port. Trade and contract talks, a fluid situation. $20,000 in gross revenue just sitting out on the water. The pressure as losses pile up. Canada's chronic shortage of crucial drugs. I ended up using my last dose just two days ago. Lives on the line and the push for a lasting antidote. Plus, the auction that has Canada all wrapped up. It's funny and it's silly and it's stupid. The giant Donaire costume being sold by the Alberta government. Oh, as long as I'm not paying for it. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. Emerging signs late tonight of a potentially positive development in the crippling standoff between more than 7,000 B.C. port workers and their employer. This evening, the union revealed that effective immediately, the 72-hour strike notice it had issued earlier today for Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time has now been removed. But there is still no word of a deal. Today, facing mounting pressure to intervene, the Prime Minister convened an emergency summer crisis meeting. As CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports, this isn't just a labor clash, it's also a political one. Picket lines at the Port of Vancouver are abandoned for now, as tonight the union removed a strike notice for Saturday, leaving the situation uncertain. My patience, personal patience, has run up over the last couple of months. A tentative deal put forward by a mediator last week was rejected by union leadership yesterday, sending striking workers back out. The labor minister said this strike is illegal, citing a ruling by the Canada Industrial Relations Board that the union did not provide the 72-hour notice required. Today, the union representing port workers shot back, saying it's appealing that decision. The union says it has been in a legal strike position since July 1st, but suspended picketing at the request of the Minister of Labour and accused its employer of deciding to exploit our good faith. We have to get goods moving again. Otherwise, we're going to be losing jobs across the country. It's estimated more than $10 billion in trade have been disrupted over the 13-day work stoppage. Small businesses are hit hardest with loads of cars, auto parts, clothes, toys, food, and even wine stranded in shipping containers. I, you know, have about $20,000 in gross revenue just sitting out on the water. Official opposition leader Pierre Polyev is demanding the government end this now, while the NDP says it won't support any back-to-work legislation. We encourage the government to, to not interfere with this beyond encouraging the parties to negotiate a fair deal. The Prime Minister says he wants the ports open as soon as possible and discuss potential strategies with top cabinet ministers and officials today, Omar, though no actions were announced after. All right, Kevin, thank you. A deadly helicopter crash involving members of the Canadian military is now the subject of a lawsuit against the American company that made the aircraft. CTV's Atlantic Bureau's chief, Creason Adjikate, joins us now with more on the allegations. Creason, what do we know? Omar, the lawsuit comes from the families of six Canadian Armed Forces members who were killed in that helicopter crash more than three years ago. The lawsuit alleges Sikorsky, a Lockheed Martin company, prioritized their sales and profits over the safety of its passengers and pilots, saying it was grossly negligent in not performing adequate safety analysis or testing of its Cyclone helicopter's autopilot flight control system. Six Canadian military members were killed after their helicopter crashed into the sea off the coast of Greece in April of 2020. One year after the crash, a flight safety investigation found that the helicopter's autopilot controls plunged the aircraft into the ocean as the pilot was turning sharply to return back to its ship. The lawsuit also claims Sikorsky failed to warn the military and its pilots of what it calls a lethal design defect. Tonight, Sikorsky denies the allegations and says they're prepared to fight them in court. Omar. All right, Creason, thank you. Relatives of a U.S. soldier who fled across the border from South Korea into the north are anxiously waiting for word on his whereabouts. They are speculating he may have felt overwhelmed by his legal troubles. Here's CTV's Washington Bureau Chief, Joy Malbin. 
It's unclear what drove Private Travis King to willfully dash across the DMZ into communist North Korea. That's him, wearing a black hat, standing with other tourists moments before he bolted. This New Zealand woman Outside. was there. Yeah. Suddenly I noticed a guy running, a guy dressed in black, running, for, looked like full gas towards the North Korean side. Um, and my first thought was, what an absolute idiot. I assumed he was sort of getting a mate to film it for some kind of TikTok stunt or something like that. But he didn't stop. He just kept running, his mother pleading today. I just want my son back. Get my son home. It don't make no sense to me. Something just got to be going on in his head. King is believed to be in the custody of Kim Jong-un's brutal regime. So far, silence from North Korea. But he's not going to be put up uh, in the Four Seasons. They take him to this empty room, sitting on an empty chair, you know, and table. Uh, he'll be interrogated for hours. King had just been released from a South Korean prison for assault and damaging a police car, escorted to the airport to fly home, facing possible discharge from the army. He slipped away with the tour group. The incident comes at a time of high tension. North Korea fired off two ballistic missiles yesterday as the U.S. sent a nuclear submarine to the south for military drills. The concern now? If he indeed uh, is a permanent defector, if you will, um, rather than somebody to be negotiated over, that's the decision that the regime has to make. Is this somebody that they want to use as a bargaining chip? North Korea has rebuffed Washington's diplomatic efforts for some time now, the White House relying on South Korea and Sweden to help negotiate King's release. Omar? All right, Joy, thank you. To Ukraine now, where Russia bombarded the port city of Odessa for the second night in a row, damaging critical infrastructure and wounding at least a dozen people. Drone strikes and missile attacks crippled a significant part of Odessa's grain and oil export facilities. The Kremlin says the attacks were retribution for Monday's destruction of a key bridge linking Russia to the Crimean Peninsula. Toronto's new mayor introduced an urgent motion today to find shelter beds for refugees who were sleeping on the streets. As CTV's Adrian Gobriel reports, the strain is a symptom of the housing affordability crisis prompting some people to leave Canada altogether. Skids full of food bring hope, where just days ago, very little existed. Asylum seekers have found safe haven in a Toronto church after sleeping on the streets. This week, the federal government stepped up with $97 million, a short-term influx of cash that's not enough, according to Toronto's newly minted mayor. The $97 million is, uh, will only shelter 2,000 refugees already the existing in our shelter systems, 3,100 refugees, and there are a lot more coming. Though in May, City Council sent out this release saying they needed $97 million to support asylum seekers accessing the shelter system. That's exactly what Toronto received. One thing all levels of government appear to agree on is the need for a coordinated affordable housing plan. That is a much bigger conversation because people who come here are going to tap into the same housing supply that Canadians tap into. The strain on Toronto's shelter system magnifying Canada's affordability crisis. So am I just working to survive or am I working to thrive? Ronald Cameron is one of several Canadians to reach out to CTV News who've left their country because of the high cost of living. I started to see that my country wasn't always working in my best interest. Just 10 days ago, the 48-year-old and his wife moved to Barbados. And my cell phone bill is about one-third what I was paying for in Canada. The couple are renting this three-bedroom island home for about $3,000 a month. The average price of a three-bedroom apartment in Toronto is nearly 4500 a month. Just one example of the housing difficulties vulnerable families will face when they arrive in Canada as some Canadians decide to pack their bags and leave. As for the immediate problem, 200 people are using this church as a shelter. The city is short 150 beds, with hundreds more fleeing persecution, expected to arrive in the next month. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Doctors in Canada are postponing potentially life-saving tests on heart patients because of a nationwide shortage of a critical medicine. CTV's Heather Wright on the impact and the fresh calls to overhaul drug supply. Early detection for any disease is key, but at this Calgary cardiology clinic, patients have been put in limbo because of a nationwide shortage of a vital medication. 
In fact, I ended up using my last dose um, uh, just a few days ago, uh, and uh, I don't have medication at all. Dipritamol is a drug used for heart imaging in patients who can't do a traditional stress test on a treadmill. An issue with manufacturing has caused this disruption, but Dr. Anmal Kapoor says it's just the latest drug shortage to impact heart patients. Nitroglycerin spray used to treat chest pain has been in short supply for months, as have certain blood pressure medications. Why all cardiology patients have to go through this struggle, like why we have to be keep saying sorry again and again and cancel these patients again and again and putting their lives at risk. But it isn't just cardiology patients. According to the Health Canada website, there are critical shortages for 24 drugs, including amoxicillin. In a statement, Health Canada says it has imported a variation of dipritamol cleared for use in the United States, which will be delivered this week. It's also working with hospitals to conserve existing supply and extend its shelf life. The problem goes back decades. Dr. Barry Power says pharmacists are spending roughly 20 percent of their week dealing with the impact of drug shortages. It's a huge time burden on pharmacists, physicians. It's a worry for patients. Only two manufacturers supply this country with dipritamol, and both are experiencing a disruption. Doctors and pharmacists say this is yet another example of why Canada needs to diversify the companies it buys medicine from and do a better job of stockpiling critical drugs. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. And no word if there will be any drug shortages in the U.S. after a major manufacturing plant in North Carolina was hit by a powerful tornado today. The twister caused extensive damage to this Pfizer-owned facility. Fortunately, all of the workers got out safely. There is no respite from the record-breaking heat for millions of Americans tonight, while in Europe, wildfires continue to rage. New evacuation orders have been issued for areas near Athens. Now Italian firefighters are helping battle the flames, even as 23 cities there are under extreme heat alerts. In northwestern China, Tourists brave the mercury to see this giant thermometer capture a surface temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. Warming of the world's oceans may be the reason why predators are venturing into areas they typically don't in Canada. CTV's Vanessa Lee on the rare sightings. It's something few would expect to be lurking in Quebec waters. Two great white sharks were recently tracked off the shores of the Gaspé Peninsula. This video was taken when they were tagged in Georgia back in December. We use uh, satellite tags. There's a specific type that we mount on the first dorsal fin. And when a shark comes to the surface and there's an air interface, the tag knows that it's dry and it begins to transmit. And in, if there's a, an Argo satellite overhead, we're able to get a, a pretty precise location. You want to, who's got class for measurements? Scientists with OSEARCH, a global nonprofit, tracks the movement of sharks and other marine animals. They say the Great White tends to make its way up to two main areas, off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts and Atlantic Canada. It's not unprecedented for them to migrate this far north but it's rare. White sharks have probably always been coming up to an Atlantic Canada to an extent, but we think it's also possible that with warming seas and climate change, they may be going a little bit further north uh, than they used to. These juvenile sharks, which were named Simon and Jekyll, are almost three meters tall and weigh about 450 pounds. My best guess is Jekyll and Simon are looking for aggregating uh, schools of, of large fish, perhaps cod or mackerel that may be spawning at this time of year. It's estimated there are hundreds, if not thousands, of great whites in Canadian waters at any given time in the summer. I'm advising people not to go swimming at dusk and dawn or at night. Um, don't go alone. Scientists anticipate the great white to stay until early fall and start heading south for the winter. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. The Canadian-born president of one of the world's most prestigious universities revealed today he is stepping down following a report that found flaws in his past research as a neuroscientist. Mark Tessier-Levine's resignation takes effect August 31st. The review found significant issues with the studies he supervised decades ago, but cleared him of scientific fraud. Coming up, Canadian pride on the pitch. We want to go all the way. <laughs> Elevated expectations on the eve of the World Cup.
Plus, the appetite for a life-sized Donair suit up for auction. The opening match of the Women's World Cup will still go ahead despite a deadly shooting in the host city. Police presence has been ramped up in Auckland, New Zealand after two people were killed along with the gunman. The suspect opened fire at a building site. Six people were also injured. Team Canada is playing its first game in Australia, the other host nation, and where CTV's Melanie Nagy is tonight. In the middle of Melbourne, which is Australia's second largest city, there's a soccer field filled with tenacity and talent. Team Canada on the pitch practicing for their first World Cup against Nigeria. We want to go all the way. <laughs> Goalkeeper Kaylin Sheridan says the squad's anticipation and expectations are high, but the 28-year-old from Ontario is quick to add that the competition is stiff. This is going to be the most competitive World Cup ever. Held every four years, the World Cup is the biggest global event in women's soccer. And for Canada, the journey to Australia has been riddled with obstacles. We talk about climbing a mountain, we're just taking one step at a time. Part of that climb has been the women's ongoing push for pay equity and more support from Canada soccer. And our lawyers are dealing with that away from here. Um, they've done an amazing job of keeping this a stress-free environment in that regard. But it's not just Canada putting on the pressure. Other teams are also speaking out, with some pointing at FIFA for offering less prize money at the Women's World Cup than at the men's. A recent promotional video for Team France used visual effects to replace women's faces with men's, a statement meant to challenge perceived prejudice. The Matildas, Australia's team, have also been drawing attention to the pay gap. The current total FIFA prize is only about a third of what was handed out at last year's Men's World Cup. Of course it would be great for all of us, you know, to be paid equal prize money as the men. I think we're a little bit of a ways off it. As for Team Canada, while they're not backing down from their fight for fair treatment, they are putting it aside for now. That's because their focus is firmly on winning their opening match. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Melbourne. Still ahead, a cold case heats up, reviving the investigation into the murder of Tupac. A search warrant executed in Las Vegas is reviving interest in one of the most famous unsolved murders in the last 30 years. Police won't say what led to this new twist, only that it's connected to the fatal shooting of rap icon Tupac Shakur. Here's CTV's John Venavelli Rao. He's a legend of hip hop and Tupac Shakur's murder, one of the biggest cold cases in music history. But after armored vehicles and a SWAT team moved in on a home outside Las Vegas, some wonder if police have made a breakthrough. The fact that this search warrant was issued is game changing. The home police raided is located in Henderson, Nevada, less than 25 kilometers from the spot where Tupac was shot in 1996. He was in a black BMW and had just left a Mike Tyson fight at the MGM when he was killed in a drive by shooting. There's still a lot of people who are very, very mad that whoever shot and killed Tupac went off, you know, scot free. One potential suspect long talked about was a known gang member named Orlando Anderson who'd been beaten up by Shakur earlier that night. The incident later portrayed in a movie. All the chicks was like, Tupac. Five years ago, in a documentary, Anderson's uncle claimed he and Anderson were in the shooter's car, but he refused to publicly reveal who pulled the trigger. He also wrote a book about it. The home police search contained items related to the uncle. It would be something to find out the, the actual what happened. You know, to, to, you know, for the family and for, for all those who, who are involved, uh, kind of put closure to it as well. Anderson was killed in a gang shootout in 1998. During their search, police reportedly seized computers, hard drives, and old photos of people who may have been linked to the shooting. In his short life, Tupac sold more than 75 million records and last month received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Tupac knew deep down that he was always meant for something great with many hoping a revived investigation will finally lead to some answers. 
John Venavelli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. And switching gears to an incredible jump rope trick that has sent a 15-year-old Japanese boy into the Guinness Book of World Records. He landed what's called an octopal under, where he swung the rope around eight times on a single leap. So fast, you can't even see the rope. After the break. Well, I see a, a, a really great costume prop. The battle of the bids over a unique auction item. A peculiar item in a government auction is sparking a bidding war. CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier unwraps the battle for bragging rights to don a donaire. In a government surplus warehouse, you'll find a lot of typical boring office items, but near the back of this facility, something a little more unique. This is a donaire costume owned by the Alberta government. It recently went up for auction, bids quickly surpassing $1,000. $1,000, that's crazy. Yeah, I'd buy it for a Halloween costume. I'm Graham Moserman, and I am defeated. This Edmonton radio host bids $600. How could I not? Uh, it's just too good not to. But Graham Moserman's bid was quickly beat. Are you sort of glad you got outbid? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was not looking forward to the conversation with my partner. Hey, uh, what can we spend half a mortgage payment on? But how did this wearable wrap end up here? And why is it so good, even to the expert eye? I see a, a, a really great costume prop. This is, uh, looks like a donaire. Yeah, we worked really hard on it. It turns out Tony Gardner's Hollywood-based special effects company created the Canadian culinary costume back in 2015. It was intended for a public service announcement on drug-impaired driving that was never produced. So it started fairly straightforward, other than most of the people in the shop asking me, what a donair is. Alturian Inc. also made the famous Daft Punk helmets and turned Johnny Knoxville into Bad Grandpa for the Jackass series. Even for the pros, this was a challenge. So there was a lot of obsessing over the texture of the meat and then the finish on the meat and then the shine of the sauces and the viscosity and stuff like that. The sweet and savory snack turned film quality attire is up for auction until August 14th. It initially cost around $15,000. So if you want it, you'll likely have to bid high. Don't err on the side of caution. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. And in case you're wondering, the top bid right now is more than $5,000. And that's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. And good night.